who said what what we saw. This kid saw this. A 28-year-old former college quarterback witnessed a rape of a 10-year-old kid in progress and did nothing to stop it. Well, what he did, that's McCreary talking about, who is the wide receiver coach on the team currently. Right. And what he did is he got told his father, and he and his father told Joe Paterno, explained the situation to Joe Paterno, and that's where a lot of the questions are coming in. Quite honestly, McCreary may have some, uh, some, some of the questions to answer, too, wouldn't you think? Of course. Yeah, there's more than a few people that need to answer some questions. Of course. Let's ask some questions now to Corey Geiger from State College's ESPN Radio 1450. He joins us on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline as we try and get a sense of what people in the area are saying. Corey, what do you want to do? I'm tired of fucking his, you know, celebrity figures being able to get away with shit that if any other normal motherfucker would do, you know, his ass would be incarcerated, no questions asked. But it's, you know, the respectable, you know, Joe Paterno from Penn State. Ugh, we're, let's just wait it out and let it wash away. Maybe it's not true. Maybe he didn't. These allegations of, you know, child abuse and or molestation and all that. Horrific shit. It's like, you know, it's Joe Paterno. He's so respectable. He wouldn't do that. And I hate how that fucking gets washed in with the fucking... The, there's the, uh, the deeper side of it all, you know. It's, oh, he's, he's a respectable man, football coach. Joe Paterno wouldn't do that. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. But if it's an average Joe, if it's, you know, if it's fucking, you know, if it's Big Bub Big Mac, you know, sh you know, that, that fool ain't, you know, Don't go to, you know, don't do it. Just drop, if you're going to Penn State, just drop out. If you're going to Penn State, just drop out of college. Drop out of college. Corey Geiger from State College's ESPN Radio is with us here on Mike and Mike in the Morning. Of course, from a national perspective, Joe Paterno is the name that everyone gravitates to because he's one of the legendary figures of all time. Just how much does this get to him? I, I guess what I'm saying is at this point, is there anyone there willing to give him the benefit of the doubt because of the fact that he has generally been seen for 50 years as having been a decent person? He's been given the benefit of the doubt on every single situation throughout his legendary career. He's not been given the benefit of the doubt on this one by many, many people here. People are outraged. You talk to people up here, they're time, they, they say it's time for him to go. Joe Paterno is safe legally. I, I think Joe Paterno is probably safe legally, but morally, his actions in 2002 by basically just washing his hands of this situation, not seeing it through, not making sure that Jerry Sandusky was uh, uh, in that the investigation went uh, forward uh, appropriately, not making sure that they protected that young boy. He was very negligent in his actions in 2002, morally. Legally, maybe he'll be perfectly fine, but that's the sticking point here, that this man has built his life and his reputation on integrity and character and leading young men, but he botched that situation so badly, guys, that uh, it is it infuriated not only people here, but obviously people around the entire country. He's going to eventually have to talk about this. If you're in that press conference, what is your first question to Joe Paterno? My question for Joe Paterno, you have to, you have to word things very carefully because he doesn't hear all that well. You have to make sure he understands word for word what you're saying. And if he doesn't like the question, he'll just typically dismiss it anyway. That's any, any given press conference. But my question is, Coach, can you honestly say that you did everything you possibly could from a moral standpoint to protect young children from be allegedly being victimized by Jerry Sandusky? That, that would be my question, and, and, and if I get a chance to ask today, that will be my question. Now, uh, Corey, we thank you very much for your time and your perspective today, and certainly a lot of passion. Mike and Mike in the morning, that's Corey Geiger from State College.
Uh, we are brought to you in part by CenturyLink, a new kind of broadband company linking Americans coast to coast with consistently fast speeds and honest personal service. Find out more at CenturyLink.com. CenturyLink is a proud sponsor of ESPN Radio's college game day tour starting at noon Eastern this Saturday from Stanford. That's one big college football game. There's another one in theory, which is Penn State yeah. taking on Nebraska. And have you, can you ever think of a game that all of a sudden seems less significant than this? Uh, I, and, and getting some of the news I just heard from Corey there about Sandusky being back there with another child, I, I, I got chills when I heard that. I'm, I'm sickened right now. Mike, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Mike and Mike. said that detectives, this was in the grand jury report, detectives listened in as the mother of one of the boys called Sandusky to confront him. According to the grand jury report, Sandusky told her, I understand I was wrong, I wish I could get forgiveness, I know I won't get it from you, I wish I was dead. The next sentence in the column says, the local district attorney declined to prosecute and the investigation was closed. So you say to yourself, how in the world could the local district attorney have declined to prosecute this case? Well, you're never going to know. The local district attorney has gone missing and is presumed dead. He went missing in 2005. For details on this, let's bring in Sarah Gannum. She is from the Patriot News, and her reporting in the newspaper this morning is excellent. She has, at, at minimum, two fascinating stories. We've read them both. The first is about the prosecutor, whose name was Ray Gricker, and we welcome Sarah to Mike and Mike on the, uh, on the subway fresh thick hotline. Sarah, tell us what you can about this local district attorney who made the decision not to prosecute Jerry Sandusky all those years ago. It's really an interesting subplot. Uh, Ray Greekar's story is very it's, it's fascinating. It's been the subject of a lot of conjecture, a lot of speculation for the past seven years. He went missing basically after taking a drive, uh, to at work, going on a drive to go antiquing. His car was found several towns away, and he, his laptop was thrown into the Susquehanna River, and the uh, hard drive was damaged beyond read. So there's a very, very little information. Investigators in that case haven't been able to even find a direction to go, whether it could be a walk away, a homicide, or a suicide, for seven years. They've had lots and lots of, of leads, but nothing credible. So, I mean, that's a whole, a whole it's, a, it's a very interesting subplot to this story. Now, we have no information that this is, uh, could somehow be related to the jury's end up 
speculation. I mean, that's all purely speculation at this point on the part of um, people who are reading about both of these stories, especially people who are reading about both of these stories for the first time. The interesting thing about Ray Grecar is that he was a very private, quiet man, a person who was very introverted almost. He didn't go to Penn State football games. He did not care about Penn State University. He didn't have affiliations or belong to organizations. So he wasn't the kind of guy you would think could be persuaded against filing charges. In fact, he prosecuted a lot of high-profile Penn State football-related cases when he was PA, and he was PA for several decades. So, so, Sarah, I mean, uh, most of us are, are not lawyers, but when we read a story where we see the detectives listen to the phone conversation of a mother talking to Jerry Sandusky, who basically admitted to what he was doing, and then in the next paragraph we read the district attorney didn't file any charges, we, we all ask, okay, why? Did anybody in the office, have you been able, anybody been able to find out from anybody in that office? Now, obviously we're not going to find out from him, but anybody else associated with that, why they didn't pursue this? I did talk to an investigator who was in the room with Greekhart when he got the phone call from those two detectives that hung out in, that, in, the, in the spare bedroom and listened into the confession. And all that person could tell me was that Ray got the call and he said he would make a decision in a few days and get back to those police officers. That person didn't know why he made the decision that he made and it was never really followed up. But you have to remember that in the, this happens as discretion in a lot of cases. This wasn't the most heinous of the reports that we know of. You know, this was not a case of rape. It was a case of touching and not to minimize it or anything, but it wasn't a you know, it, it might have been not so clear cut. I know there was a confession that he did something uh, inappropriate, and the CYS uh, investigator who talked to the mom said basically, and this is according to the mom, but she said that he told her basically, Jerry's a dumb jock and he just doesn't know any better. Mm. Mike and Mike and Sarah Gannon from the Patriot News who's reporting on this story today is very interesting. Now let's get to your other story, and that is uh, interviews with the mothers of two of the alleged victims of Jerry Sandusky. Can you tell us a little bit about those conversations and the emotions there? Yeah, I mean, the emotions are basically in sync. They just feel betrayed. They feel betrayed by law enforcement who didn't do anything in 1998. They feel betrayed by Penn State University who didn't do anything in 2002. Um, the mother of victim six is, is the mother of the 1998 shower incident child. So she just feels awful for the victims that came after that because her son came forward, he kind of put himself out there, and he wasn't believed. And because he wasn't believed, for whatever reason, several more children in this event were abused after that. The mother of victim one, who is really the last victim to come forward, he was the only one who was believed uh, up until 2009, and she just feels like this didn't have to happen. And in and, and her case, her son's case, is one of the worst, because it was one of only two in the presentment that details really like a long-term relationship of, of grooming, very continuous sexual acts. The other six are, as far as we can tell, one-time incidents in the shower in the Lash building. The other two are a much more of a long-term, continuous assault. So, Sarah, these were interviews from the mothers. Do you have any expectation in talking to them that they're, you know, th these were children then or in their early 20s, 20s now, that any of them will come out and tell their story? Well, you know, I think that a lot of them are really dealing with two, two kinds of anxiety right now. One, the anxiety of being a victim and having to deal with the criminal process, but two, the amount of attention that this case has gotten. And I know that they have been talking to each other to some degree. And that